I got a call on my smartphone saying my daughter had collapsed. I quickly caught a taxi and rushed to the hospital, but by the time I arrived, she had already passed away. Why? Tears welled up, and a deep sense of frustration, even deeper than sadness, began to swell inside me. The doctor said it was a heart attack. David, my son-in-law, told me in a calm voice. The three granddaughters who had come with him were crying their hearts out. It's no wonder they were so upset by this sudden occurrence. They are still teenagers, at such a sensitive age. I couldn't help but hold all three of them tightly. Then, we had my daughter's funeral. Her boss and colleagues from work attended the service, mourning her untimely death. But that night, David said something unexpected. I'm marrying the president's daughter, so I don't need these kids anymore. You take care of them, old hag. Incredibly, he made this outrageous declaration, openly abandoning his family. And just as he said, after the funeral, he disappeared without a trace. When I tried to contact him, his phone was disconnected. What did he plan to do with his daughters? I moved into my daughter's house to take care of my three granddaughters. One day, when I returned from shopping, I heard loud laughter coming from the living room. The grandkids were laughing at something. And then they quickly grabbed a piece of paper that had just come out of the printer and handed it to me. Looks like dad's going to hell now, huh? My youngest granddaughter smiled sweetly as she spoke. My name is Jade. I raised my daughter, Helen, as a single mother. After losing my husband when I was in my 30s, Helen and I lived together. Through her rebellious teenage years, which now seem like a distant memory. Despite the struggles of raising her alone, I tried to give her all the love I could. When Helen got into college, she said something that touched me deeply. Mom, I know you've worked so hard to raise me, and I want to give back and take care of you from now on. I remember feeling a lump in my throat when she said those unexpected words. After graduating from college, Helen got a job at a prestigious company. She was always a strong child, rarely complaining about work. Though sometimes I wished she'd lean on me a little more. Once she started working, she began surprising me with trips for my birthday or Mother's Day every year. Thank you, Helen. I'm so blessed. Me too, Mom. We exchanged shy smiles at the hotel during one of our trips. Eventually, Helen found a partner and told me she wanted to get married. Her fiancé, David, was her colleague at the same company. He had a confident demeanor, wore expensive suits, and exuded a gentlemanly aura that left me impressed. Later, Helen told me that David had been popular among the female employees since he was a new hire. Handsome, tall, well-groomed, and an elite in the company, it was no wonder. I couldn't help but wonder what made him choose Helen. Why did I choose Helen? Well, she's incredibly dedicated to her work, and... And... She's also very devoted to her family. That's something I admire about her, and I couldn't help but be drawn to her. The way they blushed and exchanged glances made me think they were a perfect match. 
They got married and, a few years later, had three children. Even after getting married, Helen and David continued to work at the same company, with David now working in the HR department. His popularity never waned, and despite having a wife and kids, female employees continued to approach him. Helen began to express her concern about how easygoing David was with everyone. He gets all these lunchboxes from different women. He says he refuses them, though. Don't worry, David seems like a trustworthy guy. I hope so, but you know, some people just enjoy stealing others' partners. I've never seen that, but is that really a thing? Nodding vigorously, Helen minched on some cookies. Since giving birth, I've noticed she's become stronger in many ways. As a wife and mother, she's grown, updating her inner self. But whenever she's troubled, I always make sure to lend an ear. As for my granddaughters, there's Emily, the eldest, and the twins, Martha and Fiona, all girls and very close. The three sisters have grown up well, with Emily now in her third year of middle school, and Martha and Fiona in the fifth grade. Despite the age difference, they all share a love for mystery novels. Last Christmas, they asked for the complete works of Arthur Conan Doyle. I wondered if that was something for kids their age to read but all three of them just laughed together and said, Weary mystery nerds. Their room is apparently filled to the brim with mystery novels. I usually see my granddaughters during summer break when they come to stay with me, and they are always so attached to me. Grandma, let's go to the movies. They're re-showing Agatha Christie's work. And we want popcorn too. Even if it's just for a few days, when I see their beaming faces, I can't help but want to do everything for them. All right, all right, let's go. My daughter has warned me not to spoil them too much, but that's easier said than done. One summer, during a heat wave, I received a call on my smartphone saying Helen had collapsed. What, David, is this really true? My hands trembled, and it felt like my heart was being squeezed. But David, on the other end of the line, calmly, almost as if it were just a routine message, told me which hospital Helen was in. I quickly caught a taxi and headed to the hospital where Helen and David were. But by the time I arrived, Helen had already passed away. Tears welled up and a deep sense of frustration, even deeper than sadness, began to swell inside me. Why? I called her name over and over, wanting her to respond. But her tightly closed eyelids never opened again. The doctor said it was a heart attack. The granddaughters who had come with him were crying their hearts out. It's no wonder they were so upset by this sudden event. They are still teenagers at such a sensitive age. Of course, they would feel lost. I couldn't help but hold all three of them tightly. It's okay to cry, all of you. Let's say goodbye to your mom properly. As I hugged my granddaughters tightly in the hospital hallway, I looked at David. Why, Helen, why? He had his back to us, probably trying not to show his tears. It looked like he was crying alone. He wiped his eyes with the cuff of his expensive suit. 
but for some reason, that cuff didn't seem wet. Sniffling, he turned to face us. Strangely, his eyes looked completely normal, as if he hadn't been crying at all. There were no traces of tears on his cheeks. I'm sorry for losing control. I need to go back to the office and inform them about this. He said this in a calm and detached manner. What? Can't you just call them? What about the girls? Please take them home with you. Jade, I'm sorry, but I'm counting on you. With that, he turned on his heel and left. His demeanor was so calm that it was almost scary. Or maybe he was just trying to act like it's no big deal. After that, he kept finding reasons to leave all the paperwork, including government paperwork, to me. Important business meetings, unmissable client dinners, those were his excuses. During the wake and funeral, he kept fidgeting with his smartphone. This is from a client. And it seems one of my subordinates caused some trouble, so I need to deal with it. But there are so many people from your company here too. Helen and David's colleagues, from superiors to subordinates, had come to pay their respects. There were bosses who shed tears over Helen's untimely death, female co-workers who had lunch with her and younger colleagues who admired her. Everyone shared memories of Helen, saying how she was always looking out for others. They spoke of her outstanding work and how she came up with ideas that no one else could, leading to great successes. I had never heard about her work from Helen herself. Learning about this unknown side of her now filled me with a sense of inadequacy. You're the primary mourner, so you should properly greet everyone. When I gently reminded him, David sighed with annoyance. All right, all right. At that moment, a woman approached David. Dave, I mean, David, my deepest condolences. The moment she saw me, she quickly changed her tone. I found it suspicious, but David seemed unconcerned, even pleased, to see her. Laura, thank you for coming despite your busy schedule. Oh, Jade, this is Laura Wilder. David suddenly became very talkative and even mentioned that she was the daughter of the company's president. Watching them, I couldn't help but notice how unusually close they seemed. It seemed they weren't old friends or childhood acquaintances either. Even at the funeral, Laura wouldn't stop clinging to David. As if to say, this is my place, right by his side. My gut feeling, which I wished would stay quiet was telling me something was off. That night, after the grandkids were asleep, I confronted David about his relationship with her. He responded with clear irritation. What? Oh, Laura? Well, yeah, she's my girlfriend. I couldn't believe my ears. Girlfriend. After I get married, I realized something. Helen is plain, boring, and not at all glamorous. I stared at him, shocked by his words. Even though we have money, she just kept saving it all for the kids. He spat out the words, clearly fed up. I got tired of living like we were poor. Saving is necessary. You have three kids' education to pay for. Helen told me that too. That's why I kept telling her I wanted a divorce. Over and over. Over and over. But she refused every time, saying it wouldn't be good for the kids. 
She wanted to wait until they were adults. Maybe, as someone who grew up with a single parent, she didn't want her daughters to go through the same thing. She always put the kids first, and I was always last. She's just too serious, and I'm sick of it. I couldn't understand him. What kind of family doesn't prioritize their children? He was an adult, yet he seemed to only think of himself. As he fiddled with his smartphone, David said in an irritated tone, That's why I started dating Laura, to blow off some steam, and then I realized I'd be better off without Helen. I was speechless, unable to say anything, but he continued without a hint of shame. Well, it's perfect timing. I'm marrying the president's daughter, so I don't need these kids anymore. You take care of them, old hag. Incredibly, he openly declared his intention to abandon his family. Before I could say anything, he was already gone. Even though he attended the funeral as the primary mourner, as soon as it was over, he left the house, leaving the grandkids in a panic. When I tried to contact him, he wouldn't answer the phone. I also heard from the company that after his bereavement leave, he switched to paid leave and hasn't shown up for work. Helen never mentioned anything to me about wanting a divorce. It was a private matter between them, so maybe it wasn't my place to interfere but I couldn't help feeling that I might have been able to offer some advice. I can't let myself get sentimental now. I slapped my cheeks with both hands and packed for a few days. I decided to stay with my grandkids for a while. When they saw me, they were relieved and started crying, making quite a commotion. With their father gone too, they must have felt completely lost. It's okay now, I'm here with you. After calming them down with a tight hug, I set about preparing dinner and taking care of the laundry. I glanced at the calendar and noticed a date circled in red with the words Summer Break Starts written on it. It seemed to be starting next week. Grandma, this year you came to our house instead. I looked down to see Martha clinging tightly to my waist. Her eyes were red from crying earlier. With her innocent expression, she stared at me for a moment before darting out of the living room. Emily and Fiona didn't say anything but it was clear they were also trying to cope with the reality of the situation. As I spent time with them, I started sorting through Helen's belongings. Each item I picked up brought back a flood of memories. Why did my daughter, whom I had raised on my own with so much effort, have to leave this world so soon? Life is unfair. As these thoughts ran through my mind, I picked up a diary. Upon closer inspection, I sight had a combination lock, unlike the other things. Come to think of it, she mentioned something about this a few months ago. Helen had told me, if anything ever happens to me, I want you to look at the diary with the lock. She had even given me the combination, saying it was for my ears only. The combination was the sum of the birthdays of Helen, David, Emily, Martha, Fiona, and myself. The dial had four digits, with the left two representing the month and the right two the day. Two, seven, eight, eight, it's open. What could be written inside? Could it be a will? Part of me didn't want to look, but my curiosity got the better of me.
so I slowly turned the pages. If you're reading this, it means I've already left this world. These words at the beginning startled me. I must be reading too many novels. Shaking off the initial shock, I continued reading, only to find something that made me doubt my eyes. This can't be true. The diary detailed Helen's suspicions about David's infidelity and the steps she took to gather evidence. It also mentioned the harsh working conditions at her job. There were records of unreported overtime and evidence to back it up. Even when she reported feeling unwell, she was denied permission to go to the hospital and was even brushed off at times. She had hidden recordings of these instances in another place. When I found and listened to the recordings, I decided to listen to it right away. There I heard a harsh voice berating Helen after she asked to go to the hospital. I couldn't understand why she was treated so harshly. It seemed David was the one who had arranged for her transfer to this strict boss. My husband betrayed me and our children. He will pay for this. The diary ended with this declaration. Helen had been preparing to demand compensation from David and his mistress and to proceed with a divorce. I was astonished at how resourceful my daughter had been. But now that I had found these things, Helen was no longer here. The diary and the recordings felt useless, and I threw them aside. The three sisters continued attending school, trying to be strong. I hoped they weren't pushing themselves too hard. I did everything I could to support them, keeping a close eye on them. A week passed, and my grandkids are on summer break. In the garden, Two potted sunflowers they had brought home from school stood tall, almost ready to bloom. After the break began, the girls started spending a lot of time in David's room. I suppose, as children, they couldn't let go of the idea of him being their father. Knowing what he had done made my heart ache. Even as I sorted through Helen's belongings, I would bring snacks to the sisters. I've brought some orange juice for all of you. They were looking through David's books and scrapbooks. Almost like they were searching for treasure. At other times, they would fiddle with the family computer and tablet, arguing about this or that. I figured it must be for some summer project, so I didn't pry. Then one day, as I returned from shopping, I heard loud laughter coming from the living room. The grandkids were laughing hysterically at something. Well, well, what's so funny, girls, you seem to be having a great time. As I approached, Fiona noticed me and gave a big smile. She quickly grabbed a sheet of paper that had just come out of the printer and handed it to me. Now Dad's going to hell, right? Puzzled, I looked at the paper they handed me. Printed on it was the title of an anonymous forum thread, Gather here if you want your wife to die. What? What is this? I could tell it was from an anonymous message board, but being unfamiliar with computers, I couldn't understand what it meant. With a questioning look on my face, Emily explained. Grandma, do you see the red username here? It says Dave. Dave? Yes. Comments posted from the internet connection here show up in red. So this one was written by Dad. Sure enough, 
The comments by Dave were highlighted in red. As I read on, I saw detailed descriptions of how he had driven Helen to her breaking point. I abused my HR authority and transferred my wife to a problematic department. They're always short-staffed, so it serves her right. She's so helpful that she stays late every day to help her team, easily exceeding 80 hours of overtime each month. It won't be long before she collapses from exhaustion. How could he? I was horrified, but the comments continued. I pretend to be concerned about my tired wife, but I make her unhealthy meals loaded with oil and salt. It's hilarious watching her eat it every day. She told me her health check results were bad, but I won't let her go to the hospital or get a follow-up. These malicious words were written in red. Other users on the forum responded to David's posts with comments like you monster and keep it up. How could someone who isn't even the Grim Reaper meticulously plan to drive another person to their breaking point like this? I couldn't hide my shock at how far David had gone, especially given how pleasant he always seemed. His final post read, My wife is finally dead. She was taken to the hospital for a heart attack, and I met my mother-in-law there. I pretended to be sad. Now I'm free from her. How awful. He had reported Helen's death with joy. It was so horrifying that I could barely believe it. In the other comments, people congratulated him expressed envy, and even praised him. I never imagined such a vile world existed, and the realization made me weak in the knees. David was as cunning and depraved as a snake. How could this be allowed to happen? Anger began to well up inside me. But what surprised me most was that the girls had noticed David's behavior. It's elementary, my dear Watson. Martha said, imitating Sherlock Holmes. Even though they worked at the same company, Mom was always so busy, while Dad seemed so relaxed. It felt off. And Fiona added, Whenever we argued with Dad, he used to say something. What did he say? He said, don't rely on your mom, she might not be around much longer. If they argued, it seems David didn't have a great relationship with the girls. They must have been suspicious of their father's actions for a long time. Since then, the three sisters had been keeping a close eye on David. He frequently used the computer, and, even though he had no interest in cooking, would look up recipes and watch cooking videos. They also found search terms like unhealthy meals and sodium content in the tablet's search history and they knew about the mysterious woman in the photos on his tablet. They'd even seen him slightly smile after Helen's death and during the funeral. But the most damning evidence was the scrapbook he left behind. It was filled with articles about people who collapsed from overwork. Some of them were diagnosed with heart attacks. So, we decided that Dad was probably the culprit. We've been gathering evidence since summer break started. I see, these mystery-loving sisters had sharper observation skills than either David or I had imagined. But how did you manage to find this forum? I asked, and Martha grinned proudly. We used the tablet's search history, and I read a book about how to recover deleted history, Watson. Could a fifth grader really do such a thing? But if they hadn't, 
we wouldn't have had this printout in our hands. I thought about how lonely and scared these young teenagers must have felt after losing their mother. I recalled their relieved and tearful faces when I arrived at their house. I couldn't ignore how hard they had been trying to fight in their own way. My eyes welled up and tears began to fall. Grandma? What's wrong? I couldn't let the efforts of these little detectives go to waste. I bit my lip, looked at the three of them, and thought of Helen. He will pay for what he's done. There's no way I'll let David get away with this. I swore that he would face the consequences of his actions as a father. Thank you, all of you. Now leave the rest to me. A few days later, I visited a lawyer I knew. I showed him the evidence the girls had found and asked if it was enough to file for damages. As he looked over the printed forum posts and search history, his face clouded with doubt, saying it might not be enough. Then, could we use this as well? I presented the diary and the recordings that I had found among Helen's belongings. Let me take a look. He flipped through the diary and listened to the recordings. He then said that with the diary added, we had a strong case and could demand significant damages. We might also be able to secure child support. Afterward, I sent copies of the recordings and the diary's contents to Helen's company. I addressed them to her former boss, who had attended the funeral and had shed tears, asking him to conduct an internal investigation. He acted quickly, reviewing the recordings and diary and sharing them with the executives. David's misuse of his HR authority to drive his wife, a talented employee, to her breaking point became known to the executives. They were furious and summoned David. The investigation continued, confirming the facts and gathering testimony from other employees, ultimately leading to David's dismissal. Considering his actions, it was well-deserved. Later, I happened to run into him on the street, but he was unrecognizable. His once well-groomed appearance was gone. His beard was overgrown, and his once fine suit was wrinkled. Jade, you ruined my life. I frowned, wondering what he was talking about. After all, I had lost my beloved daughter. It turned out that his mistress, Laura, had dumped him shortly after he was forced to resign. You're still going to follow me even though I'm like this, right? When he asked her if she'd still stay with him, she coldly replied. What? I can't be with an unemployed old man. They had been living together, but she ended that too, and now he was living alone in a run-down apartment. You bled me dry with the damages in child support. I'm broke. He complained about how his savings were nearly depleted after keeping up with the lavish lifestyle of his former lover. I felt more anger than sadness. I wanted to chase after him and slap that face of his. But the fact that he didn't even ask about the girls showed that he no longer had any love left for his family. With that thought, I resigned myself to the fact that nothing I did would get through to him. Instead of wasting energy hating him, I found much more happiness in focusing on raising my three granddaughters. By the way, after David resigned, 
several executives from the company visited our home. They came to apologize for what happened to Helen. They regretted not being aware of her situation, which ultimately led to her death. They offered a large sum of compensation from the company and asked me to accept it. I was surprised by the sudden offer, but I decided to accept it. However, even with that money, my daughter would never come back. I would never be able to laugh with her again. As I thought about this, I watered the sunflowers in the garden. The large flowers stood tall, blooming beautifully. Thanks to the damages, child support, and compensation, as well as the savings Helen left behind, I was able to raise my granddaughters without any financial worries. Emily started attending a prep school as she prepared for her high school entrance exams. Martha and Fiona began enjoying mystery novels, dramas, and comics, making their days seem full and happy. Still, sometimes I'd see them looking around as if searching for their mother, and it would make my heart ache. Losing my daughter and the girls losing their mother is a sadness we all share. I hope that, as we slowly heal from this pain and loneliness, the four of us can truly smile again. Like those sunflowers, I wish for us to keep our heads held high and live life with strength.